and the sea, and the heart, and the mountain, and the refuge, and the cave, and the valley, and the land, and the sea, and the island, and the meadow, where mention of God hath been me and his praise glorified. Blessed is the spot and the house and the place and the city, and the heart, and the mountain, and the refuge, and the cave, and the valley, and the land, and the sea, and the island, and the meadow, where mention of God has been made. And his praise, Lord. Ah, 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 ooh, ooh, Um, well, I'd like to welcome everyone um, to our presentation today. Uh, we're so happy to have finally have Bill Hazen to talk about his farm in Ontario and his transitioning from conventional agriculture to organic agriculture. Um, we've been waiting a while. We wanted to have him last March, and he said, "No, no, let me let me work on this a while and take some photographs." So now we're we're really we're really waiting to see uh, <laughs> see the process. Um, so just a little bit about Bill. Um, Bill was born and raised in Niagara on the Lake, Ontario. Uh, although he was, is not from a farming family, Bill has always had a great connection to the land and a passion for growing his own food, like many of us. Um, he attended Ontario Agriculture College and Ontario Veterinary College. And his uh, study was focused on large, an uh, large animal practice. Um, he uh, practiced at the uh, Milverton Wellesley uh, Veterinary Clinic in Ontario. And has uh, been transitioning to um, his certified organic agriculture um, be began in 1998. Um, he's a member of uh, the Oxford Perth Huron uh, Rural Cluster in Southwestern Ontario and has served uh, with veterinarians without borders in Malawi and Kenya. So um, thank you, Bill, for being here today and um, sharing your story with us. Thank you, Don. So you can go ahead and share screen. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, perfect. Fine. Okay, how's that look, Don? Looks great. Okay, dokie. Yeah, I just wanna to mention to everyone that um, Bill's gonna go through his presentation and then we'll have uh, time for questions and uh, at, at the end. Okay, yeah, Bill. There were some video clips too I took in the tractor. So 
you want, might want to turn your volume. It's, it's, it's loud for me, but it's, um, I think on Zoom, it kind of diminishes the volume, the audio quality. So you might want to turn your speakers up or use some headphones if you want to hear the audio um, in some of the videos. So anyway, thank you, Don, for the intro. And thank you, Janet, for asking me to do this. I hope I live up to what you want me to do. <laughs> Taking, I'm going to take you through a, I'm going to take you through a growing season of uh, the transition. Well, we started uh, started conventional, and um, uh, I'll just go through some of the process that I that I went through here. So just uh, we've been doing it for 34 years now, so I have lots of things to share. So I'm going to take you to the farm. Compliments of Google Earth. So put your seatbelts on. Um, this slide I always. You know, that quote from Baha'u'llah about the earth is one country, whenever I see the globe, that uh, certainly comes to mind. So I'm going to take you to the farm. So we are now in uh, coming in, you know, North America. And the Great Lakes, and this is a sort of the breadbasket of Ontario. The glaciers came through and just deposited all kinds of beautiful silty loam soil. And... Uh, uh, so we have we have uh, great uh, great soil to work with. So now we're zooming a little closer. We're coming into uh, here's Stratford, and this is the home of the Nancy Campbell School. And I think it's it's a high inspired high school. Some of you may know. And so we are. This is our closest town, Amory. So. And we're getting closer. So we have actually 200 acre farms side by side right here. And uh, we have a 35 acre woodlot back here, uh, which is, has uh, sugar maples, beech, hemlock. And this is the homestead here. This is the, the home that was built in 1860s and barn, and these are the, you see here from this aerial view, the trees, these are trees that were planted for windbreaks and conservation. This is, uh, this is the, uh, the west side of the farm. And there's little trees, we can barely see them. We planted trees along here about eight years ago, two rows of trees, um, spruce and pine, or sorry, spruce and um, cedar. And we have trees planted along, uh, there's a water, it's a creek here, we got trees. And this is a, it's a two acre uh, or apple orchard right here. So most people on this group know this quote, and I'm, you know, it's probably one of the key quotes in, in the Baha'i writings about, uh, about earth and farming. Uh, Every man of discernment while walking upon the earth uh, feeleth indeed a bash, inasmuch as he is fully aware the thing which is the source of his prosperity, his wealth, his might, his exaltation, his advancement power is as ordained by God, the very earth, which is trodden beneath the feet of all men. So I think of that quote all the time when I'm walking across the farm and uh, with humility, and um, as you all know that humility comes from humus, the Latin word for earth, the ground. And I like the knowledge too, the first nations that were, you know, that had, were on this land long before us and uh, their spiritual connection with the land. And, how Mother Earth was uh, provided. So welcome to Coleman Acres. Um, Coleman's, the Coleman's were part of a mass immigration that came in the mid 1800s, some from Germany, some from Scotland. Um, the Germans built wood houses and the Scots built stone houses. So you can tell who's who in, in, our, in our area. So this is my wife, Kathy. So she, it was her, it's her home farm. Um, I met Kathy as a veterinarian. She called me to see her horse and uh, kept calling me back to see her horse. So just a bit of a background about the farm. <clears throat> Coleman's had been on this farm. They've actually been since the 1860s in the area, but this farm, they started farming in about 1894. It was typical for the Ontario back in those days. It was a mixed, mixed farm. They milked 15 to 20 cows, separated the milk, shipped the cream, Fed the skim milk to the pigs, uh, sold 
they sold seed grain and did some cash cropping with wheat, oats, barley. And they were also one of the biggest maple syrup producers in the area with the 35 acre woodlot. Um, so we purchased the farm in 1987 from Kathy's uncle, George Coleman. Um, and after, after we purchased the farm, we carried on as, as George was, uh, he, you know, he yeah, was using chemicals and fertilizer. And, um, and that was, that was the, uh, the thing in his generation, back when he was, he was born in 1910. So in the, you know, in his early childhood, he was farming organically because there were no commercial fertilizers and pesticides. But then the green revolution came in the sixties and seventies. And that was the, the big thing. So everybody got on the bandwagon and started using fertilizer and pesticides and we're getting increased yields, but they weren't realizing what was actually happening with the soil. Uh, in the mid 90s, a neighbor of mine, Rob Fleischauer, he was uh, an early adopter to organic. Um, he was the first in our area to grow organic fuel crops. And the neighbors all thought he was making a big mistake and uh, thought he'd be returning to conventional yeah, as soon as the weeds would take over. But he, he, was, um, he was meticulous and uh, he was my mentor. So I started. Um, started to do some investigate independent investigation of truth which is the basic high principle principle and uh, that no man should follow blindly his ancestors and forefathers so also another quote is um uh, the holy books forbid the eating of anything unclean or anything which is not pure so i didn't want to eat food that was grown on a chemical soup basically and, you know they put the pesticides on and and um, crop grows and harvest and eat it and, and so I didn't want to uh, supply food to others with that uh, with that uh, principle here's some other quotes I just uh, want to just want to bring in about need for tillage if the earth is not cultivated, it becomes a, a jungle where useless weeds grow. But if a cultivator comes and tills the ground, it produces crops which nourish living creatures. It is evident, therefore, that soil needs cultivation of the farmer. So what is organic? Uh, organic is a claim referring to the methods of production and minimize use of anything um, it's going to decrease the vitality of the soil, and it also what you want to promote animal, human animal management to preserve the ecological integrity. Uh, the system is governed by federally mandated standards, and, and we are certified by ProCert, and we have an inspector comes every year, and we have paperwork uh, to, to track everything, and it prohibits use of pesticides, fertilizers, genetic engineering, DMO or genetically modified organisms like the seed, sewage sludge, et cetera. So in 1998, we thought, well, okay, we've got 200 acre farms here. Let's, we'll do a trial. So on the, we started, started gradually. We did three acres, uh, a pasture field that was, had had no chemical inputs for three years. So it could be certified organic. And we put, um, Soybeans on there, and Rob Fleischauer mentored me, and we uh, actually used his equipment on my land. And uh, sure enough, we car we harvested a beautiful crop of no weeds. So, so every year we just kept on that. We just kept adding fields, and then we kept uh, we did a little bit of a trial. We did the one farm, the east farm. We uh, kept conventional, and the west farm. Sorry, the west farm was conventional. The east farm was organic. We ran side by side comparison, and the organic side continually um, yielded as well and was about three times as profitable. So we were convinced that we could do it, and we started um, transitioning the West Farm in 2007. And by 2007, all the fields on the boat were certified organic. So this is a bit of the history of organic in uh, our area. You know, um, in the 70s, things started to so started to get some regulation, some standards, and, and now there's 
as you probably all know, is widespread. We're getting widespread conversion and sustainability is the key, soil biology, and um, there's lots of farmers that are starting to do organic. So the Rodale Institute is um, been doing, for four years, been doing organic conventional comparisons in Pennsylvania. And I got some data from them. So organic yields were competitive with conventional yields after a five-year transition. This is their, their, their system. Organic systems produce yields up to 40% higher in drought. Um, because your organic system, you do tend to increase your organic matter, which tends to hold the moisture and you're more drought resistant. Organic methods also, you don't, you're not leaching uh, chemicals into, into the waterways. You're using less energy as you're not using commercial fertilizer, which takes a lot of energy and pesticides. And uh, you're releasing 40% fewer greenhouse emissions and three to six times higher profits, which we found, uh, we found that. So these are some local, local data just showing that uh, net returns on organic, um, putting in your expenses and um, income expenses and organic sort of the number they have here is about 596. Uh, our, our numbers are a little higher because our yields are a bit better. But this is sort of an average yield, they have got 31 for soybeans and where our average is um, about 46, 47. Uh, and then the conventional, so three times uh, income on organic. And this just shows it on the graph, gross returns, cost and net returns, so organic, doing better than the conventional. And one of the key things organic is putting um, organic matter back in the ground, harvesting carbon and, and getting cooperating into the ground. So, and this is what's happening on my farm, our farm. It's, um, we're getting this, we're up on this red line and this is from Rodale, and they did uh, they did manure, and then they used a legume and conventional, and the um, conventional organic matter is uh, it's not uh, as as well, but it's seen, it's certainly improving because the, a lot of the conventional farmers are adopting standards uh, as plow downs, cover crops, manure. So and I'm sure we're going to see this change too. So I'm just going to take you on a, a tour or a one year growing season, what we're doing here on the farm. Just to, um, this is the crop rotation that we're, we have uh, year one uh, it was, is a soil building year. That's the, the key in organic systems is to get the new fertility. And um, so we do that year one and we call it soil building year. And we have double cut red clover and um, that clover is uh, all goes back into the ground. We'll take the first cut off uh, and just mow it, mulch it back in, and then the second cut will harvest for seed. And uh, then we'll put on compost, hog manure, and then we'll get that all, work that all in. And then the ne next year we'll put spelt, and then next year soybeans. And year four, I was growing corn at the end, um, but it. Uh, I was having problems with genetically modified contaminant. Both neighbor farmers have grow GMO crops and the pollen was drifting. So it was, uh, it was uh, contaminating my crop. Also it's uh, harvesting corn is like in end of October, November, and it's, it's often wet and muddy and, and it's, I don't think it's the greatest for the soil. They're out there right now. I just drove here and there's people out harvesting corn and they're leaving, you know, foot ruts in their field trying to get the corn off. So this is a field of clover. Um, it, it gets sown with the, uh, when we sow the oats, it's an under, it gets sown with the oats and then just sort of, and once the oats come off, then it comes up. So it's a, oats are a nurse crop for the clover. And uh, just as on the side here, uh, clover, red clover is the national flower of Denmark. I don't know if anybody uh, is here from Denmark, but it's a national flower and it's the state flower of Vermont. So this is the clover. Um, now we're it's, a, it's the flowers have all turned brown and it's put in a windrow with a with a uh, it's with a um, swather. And uh, so once all the heads turn brown, we swath it, let it dry, and then we'll harvest that for seed. And so we do get income. I mean, we're putting all this organic matter back into the ground, but we get income from the seed. We usually get about 300 pounds and uh, it sells for $200 a pound. So we're generating about $600 an acre. And um, 
putting all the all the comp, all the uh, manure back, or sorry, all the clover back, and then we add um, compost. So we have a neighboring uh, horse farm that has uh, 40 horses, 45 horses, and uh, we get all the manure. So it comes already heated to our farm. It's already heated, and then once it gets delivered again, it gets oxygen and heats again, and that kills all the wheat seeds. The wheat seeds are, I haven't had any issues with wheat seeds coming from, from the compost. Um, and also the, uh, the heating, you know, generates a lot of, a lot of uh, mycorrhizal fungi and bacteria that are needed. And Bill, when you say heating, you just mean that it has been composted hot, correct? That's Not right. That it's yeah. been actually, just so that folks, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, it's just the compost, the, the uh, air, oxygen, you know, breaking down the, the organic material creates heat. And that's critical in, to kill the weed seeds. Because if you, you know, there's, you don't want to get any seeds, weed seeds from anybody else. If you, it's an organic system, you, the struggle is to, uh, is to uh, keep the weeds down. So we put, um, at, we work that clover in and we, and then we um, plant winter spelt. So it's planted mid-September to allow the plants to get a good start. Cause it, uh, you plant in the fall and then over, it, it goes sort of dormant in the winter and then it's ready to go in the spring. It's, it is key to controlling perennial weeds I find. And the other key is that it um, is having the compost and the manure and the clover. It, it has all the nutrition it needs and it, it grows like crazy and it and the weeds don't have a chance. It grows five, you know, five, six feet tall and it's harvested so the next summer. And uh, we're, we're getting about one, our five year average is 1.4 tons, cones, that's a metric ton, 2,200 pounds. And the current price is 650 a, a cone. So this is anybody who doesn't see spelt, this is spelt, it's harvested in the, in the kernel, or in the, yeah, in the husk, sorry. And this is the kernel and when it's sort of de -hulled. it looks a bit like wheat. It is an old wheat. Um, yeah, it's, it's been cultivated since 5,000 BC. And what's, what's nice about it, it doesn't need fertilizer, like um, the new varieties of wheat require uh, quite a bit of fertilizer to get a decent yield. So I'm just gonna take you over. This is a video, audio might not be very loud, but this is planting the spelt in the, in the um, that clover field. Uh, that's had the compost and manure, and um, I'll just see if you can, see if you can hear it. Diana. September nineteenth, twenty twenty-one. Sowing winter spelt. This was a field of organic clover that we take for seed, and um, we just work all the green green matter back in as green manure, and uh, apply uh, compost and hog manure to work that in. Just this, this field has been dissed and then uh, cultivated a couple times to get all the incorporated into the top couple inches. It's composted well, there's not much residue left on top. So it's, it's a perfect seed bed. Um, it's a beautiful day, plus 22 degrees Celsius. And um, that's what it looks like behind. Yeah, so it's a 35 acre field. That's it, so we'll, we'll uh, harvest this next end of July. So this is the, the, the spelt, uh, this is the, the following spring now, it, uh, it, it, it's uh, as soon as it warms up, it, it uh, greens up and um, starts to grow. It's a sort of early spelt, sort of mid-season spelt. And this later, later season spelt, now we're getting into July, the heads are coming. And this is a uh, late spelt and the spelt, as it grows very tall, it's, sub, sub, you know, it's supple for lodging, but usually when it lodges, it, it means we've got a heck of a crop there because it's heavy, the heads are heavy. And um, plus it's a great competitor for any, any weeds. And we're finding that uh, in Canada with the climate change, we're getting extra heat and extra moisture, at least in Ontario, we're getting extra heat and extra moisture and we're getting sort of bumper crops the last few years. And unfortunately, out Western Canada, they're getting the heat, but no moisture. So they're, they're getting uh, drought situations. And this year we've had many crop failures in Western Canada and bumper crops in Eastern Canada. So we're getting the have and the have nots with climate change. 
This is a spelt lodge yin. And this is another field that's not lodged, but it's ready to harvest. You know, it's, the heads are tipped over. And, um, and this is the, the machine we use to harvest, the John Deere 9400 combine. This is the fun part after all the work of getting the crop in and nurturing it along and, and then the harvest. So this is a little video of in the combine harvesting spelt. July 20th, uh, 27 degrees, winds from the southwest. Combining the field that was down, spelt. It's a bumper crop. This is a field that had um, beginning of the fertility cycle. Had manure, manure and comp hog manure compost and uh, plow down clover. So this spelt will be a high protein, and um, it's running about a little over 100 bushels the acre. And uh, unfortunately, I have to can't go very fast because uh, it's, I have to shave it off basically to get the heads. So, yeah, so we'll do this field and then um, got two, uh, this is a 30 acre field and then we got two 20 acres, so it's 40, so 70 acres are spelled. And then we'll get into the oats. So. This is the spelt um, being shipped out. They're loading this 40 ton of spelt going on that truck and um, sort of it's a nice clean sample. It's a beautiful, beautiful product to ship out. So it's, uh, yeah, and this little little video here I just have of the truck leaving at the end of the journey. You know, it's just... This is another load of organic spelt, 40 ton, heading to Consumer Farms, not too far. The end of the end of the journey. Planting, looking after the weeds, harvesting, and now we're shipping out. Ten more acres to go. It's, uh, this is interesting. This is the the driver of that truck. He got out of his truck, and uh, I recognized his accent, the Malawian accent, and I said hello to him. I'm Mula Bwenji in in Chichewa. He's language from Malawi and his eyes brightened up and he was so excited that somebody had been to his country. And I, I have this Malawian hoe. This is the, in Malawi they have a short handle of hoe that they use and everything's done by hand. And uh, I brought children my Malawian hoe, which he had had lots of experience with as a youth. So, um, but this is a, in Malawi, this is, everything's done by hand. It's a field of peanuts or ground nuts. It's all healed, and planted. And, Everything done by hand. This is a contrast from here. So just the soybeans, this is a really high value crop. Um, and we, we planted it when the, in, the, in the spring when the ground is good and warm. We want a quick germination. It's usually planted around my wife's birthday. So we have to sort of delay her birthday party for a little bit after we get the beans planted. Um, we do use our own seed. And that's cuts down on costs and eliminates any contamination. You know, anytime you bring things from outside, you have a risk of contamination, GMO, genetically modified seed contamination. And we do grow an early bean, so we harvest in mid-September. We have good weather, and uh, try and so the soil is usually nice and dry. And we plant in twenty-inch rows. Uh, we do use I do use a Trimble guidance system, which is made uh, planting soybeans and and. Uh, Weeding so I've been so much easier with the uh, guides attractive. And I use a 30 uh, Einbach pine weeder. That's a key too for organic soybeans and a scuffler. And what's so, a scuffler, Bill, for folks yeah, I'll, like I'll, me who don't know? Yeah, I'll, show you, I'll show you, uh, it, we'll go ahead, we'll, uh, I'll show you what it, what it does. Um, so we do harvest with our own combine because it just once again eliminates, a combine comes from another farm and you could bring in weeds, weeds and also it could bring in some contamination. So, I mean, if you go all that work growing your soybeans and, and you have, you know, 30 acres of soybeans, you ship, all, ship them away and they test them and they're test positive, that gets sent for conventional beans, which is, you know, half the price. So our five-year average is 48 bushels and the current price right now is $35 a bushel. So if you do the math, that's a, that's a really good return um, per acre.
So it's a little video clip on, I have a little, little clipper seed cleaner and it's, it's kind of a nice, it's, it allows me to clean my own seed and um, being sort of self-sufficient, I like that. So the seed just comes in the top, goes through two screens. The top screen takes the pods away and the bottom screen takes the five seeds away. And the seed comes up the bottom. And this is the planting of the soybeans. We have to mix the soybeans with a inoculant. It's a rhizobium nitrogen fixing. So soybeans fix their own nitrogen. So we don't have to worry about nitrogen. They'll look after it, get it take it from the air. It's free nitrogen. And we mix that into, uh, in, I mix that in the planter there. So this is the planting of soybeans. I got a little video here. It's, uh, so I have only have a small planter, seven rows, 20 inches apart. And uh, this shows the trouble guidance system here. So May 15th, planting soybeans, field number 13, using the uh, Trimble auto guidance system, sub inch guidance. So there's the, uh, it's just over an inch there now, but anyway, it should stay well under an inch. It's the offline distance. It's my speed. Of acres today, 14 so far. And here's the uh, dusty day. Puts it in 20 inch rows, and the guidance system keeps it pretty straight. So we have, we planted we planted the soybeans and now that's the critical time is to, is to control the weeds when they're when they're young when they're just germinating that's if you if you miss that opportunity window of opportunity your field is full of weeds and it's um it stains the beans and you don't get a really good a good product so uh, this is this is a, a tine weeder I'll show you what a tine weeder it's just a um, bunch of little tines and it'll it'll show you on the video here. before they're up and this is one of the key times to get the little weeds so you don't get them now you're gonna you lose control so um, this is a time meter it gets sort of uh, very fuel efficient it's just using you know, we're going at about you know 1300 1400 rpm doing 2.84 miles an hour and this is what uh, Tine weeder looks like it's a bunch of little tines, a few inches apart, and this is a 30 foot tine weeder, so we can do quite a bit at one time. But you can see their rows; they look a little different before and after. You do you do rough them up a bit, but you need to to do that. I always say you send your hired man out to do this because these look so good after you tine weed them. But they pull through as long as got some good weather after they'll come through the little bit of dirt to throw on top of them. And here's a, a little closer up to show you exactly the action of the time weeder and how it, it doesn't really affect the beans that much, but it, those little weeds that are germinated. Um, so this is the uh, tiny weeder from the back. You see the, basically just combing through the beans, pulling out those little weeds, pulls out a few soybeans as well, but they make up Here's, here's the uh, tines. You see the little weed hanging onto the, onto the tines there. So, so this is scuffling. Uh, the scuffler is, uh, goes between the rows. It's got three teeth and fairly uh, about uh, three inch sweeps or three inch wide teeth that go along. And uh, with, the, with the guidance system, I can get within an inch of the row. And this is key for the, for the perennial weeds, which are deep rooted. So canna thistle and um, South thistle and the and perennial weeds. This will get rid of the, the perennial weeds. Uh, June 24th, scuffling beans for the last time. Uh, they'll be too big to go through. And we're supposed to get rain for uh, quite a few days here. So 
I guess this would be the last time. They look pretty clean. I'm just going through There's a little bit of perennial weeds there. Wild morning glory, a few can of thistle. And we're just taking those out. There's a little bit of iron blight back there. Yeah, iron blight is when the scuffler makes a little bit of a detour and takes out the takes out the beans. So we farmers call that iron blight, but it's, it's not a disease. But. Oh, thanks for the clarification. <laughs> there was another question that came through. Is all of this rain fed, Bill? Is all of it, what, Don? Or, is all, is all, are all of your crops rain fed? Yes, no irrigation. No irrigation. Okay, great. That was the question that came through. Thank you. Yeah. So these are the beans now. This is late. Um, they're, they're, they're flowering. The pods are starting. And you can see they're, once they've canopied, uh, the weeds don't have a chance because there's no light. So once we get them to this stage, it's like, whew, got here, we're, we're good. And um, we just let them do their thing and uh, they grow. And like I said, we've been getting heat and moisture and the, the beans have been uh, incredible, incredible yields in the last few years and incredible prices too. But um, so this is the beans that, you know, they, they'll, they start to drop their leaves sort of in August. And then September, we um, leaves are gone. We just let them come down to about a, you know, want them at 13, 13.5% moisture or lower. And then we'll, we'll harvest them. And there's a little clip of the combine harvesting the, the soybeans here. Just finished combining organic soybeans. Uh, nice clean field, looked after the weeds. Uh, and we have a good, good yield, looks like. 61.3 bushels the acre. Uh, so it's a, one of those years you have great prices and great yields. So anyway, that's uh, that's the end of this field. So oh, this is just a quick quick, quick video unloading. I won't, I won't spend much time just unloading the just capping my capping my helper. Well, I guess I'm the helper. We work together. Okay, then the oats at the end of the cycle, oats are uh, an easy feeder. I love oats. They, um, they uh, fit in nice with the rotation and we plant that as soon as the ground can be worked. Um, the earlier, the better. As soon as, like last, this year, we had an early, we had a dry spring and we got them out in March 23rd. There's a direct correlation between the yield and the time of planting and better weed control too. Because the oats, they, they, they like cooler weather and they'll jump ahead of the weeds if you get them out early. So we plant about 140 pounds the acre, and then we also plant as a nurse uh, crop the, uh, the double cut red clover. We harvest the oats at the end of July, beginning of August. And our, our average five year rolling average is 1.2 ton metric ton per acre, and the current price is 450 Canadian a ton. A ton. So these are the oats. Yeah, and then we plant them, same as the spelt. And this is the early oats, and this is the oats. You can see the clover uh, in, in dispersed in between the rows of the oats. So the oats come off and the clover um, is underneath there. So it's just, it's just okay. Uh, okay, conservation efforts that we've done on the farm. Um, we were planted trees. We put all our residue back in the ground. We got rid of our mole bore plow, which is hard on the uh, soil microbes and the earthworms. And we're using cover crops. Uh, we work with the upper, upper Avon Conservation Authority planting trees. And um, these are two rows of those two rows of trees planted on the east side. There's a row of spruce and a row of cedar. And it's the, looking down between the two rows. And in our woodlot, we have a nice little pond, the wildlife sanctuary. The uh, ducks migrating birds often will land there and uh, get some rest. Um, you know, one of the things in is kindness to animals. You know, we, if we see a, this is a raptor nest, so we won't, we'll never cut a tree down where there's a, a nest. Like this is a raptor nest up top here. And we leave a lot of the trees uh, for wildlife reserves, like this often um, 
wildlife in, in these older trees. And then this is a um, cover crop, oats. I love oats as a cover crop as well. These oats, this, this field uh, was spelt and took spelt off, planted oats, and these oats are gonna come up and they'll stay over winter and they uh, keep the ground and it, it help with erosion, um, wind erosion and water erosion. And in the spring, the frost kills the oats. In the spring, the earthworms just devour all that organic matter and makes the soil nice and uh, loamy and it works up so nice and uh, it's win-win. So we out of the concept where I've gotten rid of the moldboard plow. And this is one of the tools we use, a cultivator, which is uh, just to get that, we just work the top two inches of the ground just to uh, get the residue worked in and get a seed bed for the seed. So the woodlot is, um, my wife's father was a tree inspector for our county and he looked after this, this woodlot. And uh, we have this tree named after him. This is Harry. This is a beech tree and it's uh, it made the tree hall of fame for our province. It's the largest beech tree in Ontario. And unfortunately it's dying a majestic death and we're not cutting it down. It's just gonna, uh, we're just gonna let it do its thing. It's still, it's uh, still got some life to it, but um, it's uh, slowly dying. Um, income from the woodlot too, maple syrup has been a big part of the Coleman tradition. Uh, I used to be um, still using the pails, the old system. They used to be about 1200 taps and uh, all gathered by hand. The old evaporator, wood fired, in a finishing pan to finish the syrup. Uh, we're just doing, we scaled it down. Kathy and I just do it on our own, just as a bit of a hobby now for family and friends. And storage, I uh, have some storage. It's nice to have some storage facility because if you harvesting and you have no nobody to come and pick up the product, you can keep you can keep harvesting. And also storage, I think of Abdul Baha. He's, you know, he um, uh, he stored uh, his uh, during World War One when there's a blockade. Uh, threatened and many lives, civilians in Haifa were threatened. Abdul Ha saved them from starvation because he stored some grain. And he was actually knighted for that, for his service. And uh, I always store some grain in over winter, just in case. So there's enough grain there to feed the community if, if need be. Uh, this is um, farms also used as a eco camp. This is a Janet Kundal and her daughter Alicia had a eco camp on the farm. Kids from the children's classes and junior youth would come. Future, um, well, there's a steady increase in consumers purchasing their product products. So I'm pretty, pretty comfortable with the future and regenerative agriculture is um, the next, probably the next level of certification for me. And the other future thing would be uh, no-till soybeans. This is the organic food sales in the US, how it's increasing. Um, this is the interesting no no till soybeans. There's been some experimentation with no till soybeans, and they take rye, plant it in the fall, and then they, they crimp it and roll it with this machine, and then they no till the soybeans in. And it's it's a work in progress. It's experimenting with different levels of rye, and uh, so far the the yields have for only about half of what of what uh, with no rye. So, but that's certainly a, a thing, an area of future for, uh, for organic soybeans. Just a few ref reflections. Um, there is definitely, for me, a spiritual connection to the land. You know, the concept of oneness, um, healthy soil, healthy plants, healthy animals, healthy people. This is the First Nations looked after our mother earth. Um, Organic agriculture and regenerative agriculture is certainly changing farming systems with uh, soil biology. We're certainly realizing that soil biology is the key and Matt Slaughter's presentation was certainly focused on that. And conventional farms are starting to adopt a lot of, of those uh, strategies. And you can be economically viable on a small acreage. So our 100, 200 acre farms can survive, you can make a good living farming organically. Whereas conventional, you'll need three times that acreage to, to make the same living. Um, 
and we've been building organic matter. I feel good. That's, you know, I, I don't think we're carbon neutral at this point. We're still using some diesel fuel, but uh, we're certainly um, getting better. And the, and the food, the purity of the food, um, producing food with minimum pesticide residue. Uh, and glyphosate is so getting so ubiquitous or Roundup is getting so ubiquitous in the environment that they're actually having to raise the standards of minimum amount allowable because there's so much there. You won't be able to produce food at all if they keep the standard where it is. And we have a system that works. And uh, as my mentor, my, uh, sorry, my um, colleague, my high colleague, Una, has, she's always pushing us to go to the next level. So now we, now we, uh, next level for me would probably be a regenerative certification, which I think I'm pretty close to being, having all the requirements to do that. So, um, you know, I'd just like to close. This is just a slide last week, you know, that's our fall. These are turning. And um, it's like close with this, this picture. And this reminded me of this quote from Amtha Baha. You know, the sun was setting and the, it's, it's getting cold and the forecast is snow and and the cycle of the cycle of farmers are tuned into the cycle of, of life with their animals and their agriculture. And it's going to close with this quote, though. Furthermore, just as the solar cycle has its four seasons, the cycle of the sun of reality has its distinct and successive periods. After the spring, summer comes with its fullness and fruitage, spiritual. Autumn follows with its withering winds, which chill the soul. The sun seems to be going away until at last the mantle of winter overspreads and only faint traces of the effulgence of that divine sun remain. Just as the surface of the material world becomes dark and dreary, the soil dormant, trees naked and bare, and no beauty or freshness remain to cheer the darkness and desolation. So the winter of the spiritual cycle witnesses the death and disappearance of divine growth and extinction of the light and love of God. But again, the cycle begins and a new springtime appears in the form of springtime <clears throat> in the former springtime has returned. The world is resuscitated, illumined and attained spirituality. Religion is renewed and reorganized. Hearts are turned to God. The summons of God is heard and life is again bestowed upon man. Bill, on behalf of the Agriculture Working Group, I want to thank you so much. It has been worth the wait. <laughs> it's such a wonderful presentation. And really, I, I think I can speak for everyone to everyone's people are clapping <laughs> to see the visuals, the actual visuals uh, really, really uh, added to the richness of the presentation. So thank you so much for all the, the thoughtfulness you put into that. There are some really rich questions. I was wondering, um, Patrick, do you have good enough internet that you would like to come on and ask your two questions that you have? Otherwise, I'm happy to read them out for you. We have folks really interested in um, how this might look. And then we also have a question from Winnie and Julian. So let's start with Patrick, he's there. Well, I hope my internet is stable because it keeps on um, uh, disturbing. Uh, this is Patrick from Jinja, Uganda. Well, one of my questions is, uh, I've been conducting a research in um, Bali, Eastern Uganda, uh, with a, a company that is helping farmers to irrigate their crops and um, basically growing vegetables. And um, they use the local border border, motorcycles, but we call it border border here, to irrigate uh, uh, the gardens. And it is really, really affordable and readily available for the farmers. It's very, very cheap. And it has, it has transformed the farmers in that community very, very much. Now, during my research, I realized that the people are using a lot of chemicals from uh, uh, fertilizers to pesticides. And so that was a very big concern to me, if there is a way that they could use our organic uh, 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 chemicals, if I can say like that, in, instead of the synthetic chemicals. And then um, um, the other concern that these people raised was about the seeds, that each time they have to, to each time they have to, 
to plant, they have to go back and buy seeds because uh, when, when they plant seeds from the, the harvests, the, the seeds, the plants grow, but before they start uh, flowering, they, the plants turn uh, yellow and they die and the yield is very, very low. So they were asking me, how can we have seeds that we can be able to, uh, to replant in, and instead of going back to buy seeds because the seeds are quite expensive. So my, 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 I would be very grateful if our, we started a discussion on how to help them uh, generate seeds by themselves, but then also to uh, migrate from um, chemical or chemicals, synthetic chemicals to organic uh, uh, farming. Thank you. Yeah, maybe somebody else who's worked in Africa. I worked in Africa, but on the animal side, I didn't work on the crop side. So, but um, I know I know some of the seed companies are producing a, a suicide gene where they so you can't they don't like to use your own seed. So I'm not sure if that's part of that process or whether it's just the crop itself. Um, and so I don't know. Is there anybody else out there that's worked in Africa could help? I think it's because their farmers are planting hybrid seed, and hybrid seed doesn't let you have. Um, good it doesn't breed true so you can't get the seed that's okay the can't have the seed and so that you have to buy their seed they're making money from that mm -hmm. so the only way is to let the farmers get the original seed from the grandmothers you know the average farmer here is a 55 year old grandmother and so if you can get the original seed from those grandmothers and plant them up and look for the best every year like don't eat the best seed save your best seed every year and share that seed in your own local seed bank. That's the only way. But just as Bill was saying, there is this danger that they're trying to say that you can't plant your own seed. Well, that's a disaster because people can't afford to buy seed every year. Mm -hmm. Well, and that yeah. ties into a question that Holians asked, you know, about how do you select seeds for the subsequent season so that you're maintain maintaining plant vigor, right? Because hybrids are are bred specifically for, for vigor and yield. But if you're not using hybrid, if you're using open pollinated heirloom, whatever, those types of seeds, then how are you actually selecting for seed, Bill, or anybody else who has any experience with this? Well, I, I can tell, I think my seed act, because I've grown my own oats for, for like 15 years, and I think it adapts to my farm because like the yield keeps getting stronger and, and I think it adapts. But um, for the soybeans, you have to be careful. I've, I grow my own soybean seed. But it will sort of start going, breeding some off traits, and you have to kind of monitor that a bit. So, but so far, I've you know I'll have five six years my own seed, and um, I'm still getting good crops and saving saving like he's saying saving money because you're not buying it from the company. But uh... so if it starts to get off traits, then what do you do? Then I'll have to go and get some certified certified organic seed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there's always a risk because a neighbor grew certified organic seed and it was contaminated with genetic. So he grew his crop and then chipped it off and it tested positive for GMO. So he, you know, he, he got he lost 50% of the value of his crop and got the conventional price. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think that this, you know, both the terminator gene and this whole, you know, pollen drift or or whatever issue really highlights for us the importance of protecting the rights of farmers and people to be able to eat food that isn't those things. Um, you know, I think when we think about organic, it sounds like a, a boutique thing that only rich people can do, but you know, we have to think all the way down how that impacts. I'm sure that's a devastation for a farmer who's been growing things all organically all along. I have a question um, when you're ready. Yeah, sure. And there's a couple more questions here. Did you get your question? Um, answered about how to shift from the chemicals. Um, that was the other part of, of Patrick's question. Is anybody, Bill, or anybody here wanna help? Like how would you support farmers, especially small farmers to shift away from chemicals? No, it has to be manual weed control. So, I mean, with in Africa, at least in Malawi, it's all manual, but I'm not sure of the situation there with whether they can use some mechanical the mechanical weed control as well. It's mostly it's mostly pesticides that they that yeah. they buy chemicals and chemical fertilizer, synthetic fertilizer. So they have to compost, you know. So that's an educational thing because 
-hmm. they've been um, given promoted green revolution stuff so they've lost the knowledge that for the oldest people and people don't have a long lifespan here normally so so uh, making compost has, and green manure green manure cover crops is a really big one it's the plant green manure mm -hmm. um, and then there is bioherbicide now toothpick project has bioherbicide which improves the fusarium component of the microbiology in the soil which depresses the striga and also trees and flowers there's certain sort of flowers called tephrosia and the African marigold they they suppress pests um, ash suppresses pests garlic there's different they neem they use different ways to try to suppress the pests there's lots of experimenting going on on small farms yeah. and so then the farmer researcher network just put out some films that farmers made on their own farms now that they've got phones so there's a lot of little tidbits there things like planting cow, bee, cow pea with maize. Apparently cow pea attracts an ant that eats the fall armyworm off of the maize, also napier grass. So these little snippets of information need to be shared about, you know, amongst the farmers to get back to that organic way that they've been mm -hmm. more or less loaned for free hybrid seed and all these chemicals. And so then pay it back and they have nothing left at the end of the season. I, I think the, uh, the, pet, the insect pests, they're the real problem and they can be a problem in Canada. I've seen Colorado beetles completely destroy a potato crop on an organic farm. But at least there are some pesticides which are less harsh, you know, like pyrethroids instead of organophosphates and so on. But another problem with Africa, there isn't really much of an extension system. There's no experts out there telling people what to do. It just doesn't exist. So perhaps, as Janet says, you can get information out on farm radio or in, on that way of, of things that work. But it's, you know, it's very uh, complicated. It sounds when, when... like, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, Janet. One good news we had recently, one, one acre fund works with over a million small farmers and they were more or less giving hybrid maize seed and the, and, and the fertilizer and everything and delivering it to their villages. And, and, and then they, they realized that the price was not even covering the cost because the it's a loan, the farmers have to pay, pay the money back. And then the hybrid seed, is not, you know, as I say, you have to buy it again and again and again, and it won't grow very well without the, the chemicals. So what they've changed now to growing uh, cocoa and trees and coffee, coffee and trees. So we're excited to hear that that, that one acre fund has changed. That's within Uganda. <laughs> That's a, yeah, mm -hmm. but you know, it's a step in the right direction by far to have trees and coffee instead of these, you know, really not helpful maize. And the traditional crop here is for a staple here is, is Matoki banana plantain, and it's way more healthier and way better for the environment. And you can, it's a shade for your coffee, coffee and cocoa. And so we're hoping that people return to their traditional <laughs> Matoki and leave off the maize, which is so you know, destructive and, and uh, expensive, but it's easy to cook. But then you could have millet instead, or sorghum. You could have some other grains, spelt maybe instead of uh, maize. But people really like their maize. If they don't have, if they don't have maize, which is cooked, is called poshu and beans every day. They feel like they didn't eat, and they only eat one meal a day. Quite a lot of people here. Mm. Yeah. So it sounds like we could have a whole small group focusing on supporting, you know, small farmers, especially in the tropics to shift towards uh, yeah. organic pra practices too. And I'm sure Janet and Ned would love to be. Yes, we would. That's, that's, what that's, we're our, that's what we're doing with our small pensions and being part of the U.S. Food changing. system game changers and trying to figure out how can we mainstream regenerative agriculture. Um, I have a question for Bill. Yeah, I wanted to call on Bill, you next. You, Go ahead. you grew your own oats and you eat them as well? Uh, it, there was a miller. It's, there was a miller just like 15 minutes from me, Oak oh, Manor wow. Organics, and um, I would sell my oats to him. And um, my oats would be in all the local grocery stores. So I would go and buy my, buy my own oats back. My understanding he, was that there's two husks on, a, on oats. 
uh, outer husk and inner husk. How did you get the inner husk off? Well, I, that's, that's the millers. Uh, the millers do that. I just I just grow them. <laughs> so okay. Yeah, yeah. The, you, but you, it has to be. It has to be. Um, yeah, you have to. De- you have to get the oat growth, take the husk off, right. and then the oats have to be heated. There's some enzyme in in oats that if you don't heat it, it keeps the oats will go rancid. So you uh, have to heat the oats and then and then you roll them to make the oat flake. Right? Okay. And it's the it's the quick oats are just the smaller oats, the lighter bushel weight oats, okay. and the large flake oats are the heavy. Usually they're the hullless oats that they make the um, the quick the uh, large flake oats with. Okay, yeah. thank you. Great. We have people with hands up, but I also wanted to mention in the. Um, chat we have other questions so i want to get to those and winnie maybe yours will tie into this or maybe you had a different question but i noticed that you there's a couple questions about the machinery so one was and this was winnie so you might have this question you might have a different one how does the cost of equipment storage and maintenance all that figure into your profit totals and then the other one was from puria in iran Alampa, who said um, that their question is about using precision agriculture and variable rate application technologies if you're using that or thinking about using it in the future. You, I know you were saying you were using the GPS. So yeah. those kind of mechanical questions, I think. And Winnie, was that your question? Yes. And I, I wanted to see if the he'd been doing conventional agriculture. So was your equipment um, a new cost to you? I'm just interested in you get three times profit of conventional. How does the upkeep and, and the cost of machinery and storage and et cetera figure yeah. in? They right, equate. having to have your own things so they don't cross yeah. contaminate. Yeah, well, that, the, that was put in the equation for that final total that the, uh, the slide I showed. But it, I, I personally, I, I have bought used equipment and um, good John Deere used equipment, and uh, which is a, a fraction of the cost of new equipment. And uh, very, and I have small equipment. <laughs> you know, all the conventional guys have 250 horsepower tractors and, and uh, large equipment because they have large acres. But on, on an organic farm, you, you don't have, you don't have, get as many acres. You don't have to have have, have as large equipment. And so it's basically a few tractors. Uh, you know, cultivator, scuffler, planter. And, um, and it's, I've had them for years and years and years. So they're, they've been depreciated. And it's just the, the only cost is the maintenance, which is uh, very little. But that, it's, it, you, but that was put in that equation. So even with that put into the equation, you still have three times profit. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's great. And then what about the precision uh, uh, yeah. equipment? And Puria, if you have an additional aspect of that you want to ask, feel free to unmute yourself and clarify what your question is. I'm not sure if I got it right. Yeah, that that's the way to that's the way to go. I haven't I'm not there yet, but a lot of the a lot of farmers will will mostly conventional farmers because they're applying fertilizer, so they have they have their soil analysis. It's all been GPS, and then when they apply the fertilizer, they apply it only to the low areas based on the on the soil sampling. Mm. Uh, that's precision egg. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm still just sort of broadcasting the whole. We we soil sample the fields and uh, test them, but I still I'm not doing precision. That that's that'll happen probably. I just I'm not there yet. Great. Okay, Neil, what were you going to ask, Neil Watley? Your hands up. Um, I was just. Can you hear me? Okay. Could you speak a little louder? It's a little quiet. Okay. I was just going to say that. Uh, there's been good research done at University of Saskatchewan by Dr. Steve Shirtlip and his uh, graduate students. So that's, you can look that up online. It's uh, physical weed control. They've done many years of research. They got three different types. They have a camera used, one that uh, helps evade, prevent hitting the, the rows. Uh, there's tine and there's, there's other cultural control methods, but it's all mechanical. And I like what, uh, what our speaker today was talking about. So that's Steve Shirtlip, S H I R T L I F F E. Trying for something. Can you hear me okay? 
Yeah, it's a little scratchy, but no, we heard you well. And by the way, um, Neil did put that in the chat. So anybody who wants to get that spelling um, and that resource that is in the chat. And if you didn't get it, well, I'll cop let me know and I'll copy it and drop it back in if you joined us later. Thanks, Neil. You're welcome. Thanks for that. Um, there's also another resource, a couple of resources. Mark dropped into the chat um, some seeds resources of how to get non-hybrid seeds. So that's there for you. Um, there were a couple questions about agroforestry. So let me find those. So um, let me get there. Oh yeah, that's another good one too. Um, so Sandy is researching how agroforestry can help eliminate or reduce the weeds and provide nutrients. So that's another aspect. Um, but somebody else asked about agroforestry. So anybody who has that kind of question of the kind of beyond just the um, annual crops aspects of farming, uh, if you have a question related to that and you wanted to ask, because obviously Bill is also working on other more perennial crops too, you know, with uh, working with maple syrup and stuff. Is there anything else there that folks wanted to ask? Sounds like no. Um, and, oh, did somebody unmute? Uh, another person was asking, Karin uh, got on late and was asking if you're considering to start using biologicals like humic or folic acid, bioline gold, et cetera. Are those fam familiar to you? Yeah, we, I've used the, um, and the hog manure, before the hog manure is applied, we, we put in uh, molasses and humate or humic, humic acid, or uh, it's a humate anyway, it's a carbon source. And uh, it, it takes the smell away. It sort of starts the composting process of the hog manure. So, mm. and uh, when you apply it, you don't get that odor that bothers the neighbors. Mm. Gotcha. That's uh, cheese. Uh, there's a type of uh, fulvic acid, I guess was the other yeah. question. Okay, great. And, and for folks who don't know, like besides taking the smell away or whatever, what is the benefit of using something like humic acid or fulvic acid for the, the growing? As far as I know, it's just for composting, but unless somebody else knows more, um, I just use it to help speed up the compost process. Okay, great. I can probably add to that a little bit. Um, basically, it's also used in the uh, soils to, to improve soil biology. So if you're um, wanting to add it with something like a fertilizer, then it, then it chelates the minerals and adds, enables the biology, the soil biology to, um, partnerships with the plants so that the plants can grow quite well this, those sorts of things it's, that's kind of scary it's like it was more not more, not so much for uh, manures but more like um, if you're going to be going into cover cropping and that kind of that kind of thing thank you Karin thanks for clarifying that for us no problem. Um, Shiva asks, how do you check that the feed for the hogs and horses that provide the manure is organic or herbicide free or those types of things? Yeah, it's, it's composted, but it's, it's not, I mean, the horses are fed hay and grain, but it's not organic grain, but you're allowed to use it. So it's, um, you know, it, it's just not a bit, there's not enough organic manure to supply the field. So we, um, yeah, we're just hoping that the compost is not tested either. So it's at this point, there's, we're allowed to use it and I've been using it and you can't really, we're just hoping that the compost process breaks, breaks anything down. I mean, there's, there, um, there's uh, hopefully not much in there, but. So you're saying it, you're allowed to use it, meaning the organic standards allow you yeah, to use right. that and you yeah, still keep yeah, your yeah. certification. That's right, yeah. Okay, great. Sandy asked, do you know what the indigenous people in your area grew on the land before you, farming, uh, farmers were there or did they were they just foraging in the area? Uh, as far as I know, they're foraging. I mean, that land was all cleared by these settlers that came in the early 1800s. It was all, in our area, it was all woodlot. It was all, and um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. That's, I, I'd like to find that out myself. I don't know. 
Yeah, there's a wonderful book uh, about the Northeast. I don't know if it would talk about that area, but uh, it's called Changes in the Land. And it really talks about uh, how highly evolved the systems of land management were mm -hmm. that indigenous people have in, this, in the Northeast before colonization came and changed everything. Um, you know, and so they were actually really act cultivating you know, maximum hunting and, you know, areas to grow different, you know, perennial and annual crops and whatnot. So um, I think there's a lot more to it than we think. So books like that are really useful. A lot of the native people in this area, when they would have gardens, they would usually put them down by a river or stream. The soil's much softer and you have access to water. Mm. Um, that helps a lot if you have that. Great. Um, there is, I'm gonna drop the, that book that I mentioned, uh, Changes in the Land into the chat just because it's so useful. A really good question that's also really close to my heart and probably many of us um, is, what are you doing in terms of farm succession and are you mentoring next generations? My um, family farm in the Midwest of the United States, we lost it because we couldn't figure out how to succeed through the next generation. So I think that's a really important uh, question. And then Winnie will come to you. Yeah, my, my, I have two children. Um, they both, both moved to the West Coast of Canada and um, not interested in farming. So it's... Uh, uh, hopefully it'll go to another organic grower and uh, yeah, we'll have to deal with that soon, I think, because I'm 69. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's actually a really important thing for all of us who care about food systems to be thinking about is how do we connect, because our farm had been in CRP, conservation research, uh, conservation, uh, what do you call it, conservation resource help me. You know what I mean? So it had been, it had been out of production and for decade. So it was more organic than organic. Uh, and it just got plowed under by whoever took it over because there's nobody organic in that area. So how do you actually connect folks who want to take over a well-loved, well-tended organic farm before it comes to the crisis level? That's, that's super important for all of us in, in food systems to be thinking about. Mm -hmm. Winnie, what would you like to say or ask? Well, I'll, I'll mention just because you were the succession thing that those people who do have interest should make wills because in South Carolina, it was a huge problem around the Lewis Gregory Institute because there was lots of land owned by the black farmers in the area, but they didn't have wills. And so when they passed on, there might be one who wanted it, but it would go to the court and be uh, uh, somebody with all the money would be able to buy it. But the original thing that I wanted to mention, because you mentioned the book, is that that sounds like a good book to put on our next reading group list and to mention to folks that there are some reading groups going on now some are not very far into the books. So if you look on the website, you'll see what they are. And if you have ideas that you would like to offer, I'll put my email in the chat uh, so that you can offer for the next round of uh, reading material. Thank you. Thanks, Winnie. Thanks for a plug for the reading groups. Quant, I see your hand is up. And I also wanted, I'm dropping into the chat um, there's a new paper out by a colleague of mine uh, who I really respect, Ethan Sol Soloviev, and um, it's, uh, it's about the, the paradigms of agriculture and like what is regenerative agriculture and whatnot. And so I dropped that into the chat for folks if folks want to look at that. And I think that could be a really interesting um, study or conversation book, not book, paper group, whatever we want to call it. Go ahead, Quanta, let's see what question you have. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, you were mentioning about the next generation being encouraged to uh, 
be in, uh, engaged in farming. Is it possible that you know, we have a lot of youth programs, but I don't see a strong presence of the ag importance of agriculture in the Baha'i faith in those teachings, you know, when we are in uh, youth programs. Uh, I, I know that Gary Rocher in, in Ukraine has a beautiful farm and he has children there. And I think teaching them about the environment and agriculture, as I have seen when I was there, is a strong part of his program. Perhaps he can mention a few things about that and how we can, on a global scale, the Baha'i communities can encourage at least an understanding of the importance of agriculture in Baha'i writings. Thank you. Yeah, Gary, do you want to speak to any of that? Um, usually I'm ready to speak. It's just I'm never sure if anybody likes to hear what I have to say because it seems to be a bit different than others. I mean, yes, it's true that, you know, regenerative agriculture and agroforestry is important, but it's not anything new to people like me who's been doing this for maybe 50 or 60, 50 years now. So, I mean, it is important, but, you know, we have to think about it. For me, it's a systems approach. We need to think of the whole system, communities living together, working together finding ways to do it. And as Fika just said, or Quanta, <laughs> she's, she used to be called Fika, by the way. Quanta Don Light now uh, was talking about what's happening with the young people. I definitely would think we should be focusing our attention, people like me, on young people, because I'm absolutely convinced, as is most of the scientific community, if we look around the world and if we look what's going to be happening in the COP26 and next couple of weeks there's a lot of problems on the horizon and the young people in the next 20 uh, two, two decades let's say are going to be in a difficult situation I think in many different places and the question is are we ready to start working with these young people and really putting them first for me they're first and yes we do literally have uh, about 150 children during the summer living with us working with us we're starting aquaponics. We're starting, you know, different activities, you know, with farming and producing uh, regenerative activities, all of that to combine. And we're basically, it's mostly a teaching activity for myself and my wife, but we love to do it and the kids react to it. They respond to it. And we all know that, uh, and I think it was Neil who said, who's in our group here, wrote something along the way that, uh, that, um, that, uh, that Shoghi Effendi mentioned many years ago, that the cities are places where maybe Baha'is should not, I mean, in my words, he probably remembers the quote better, are not really the place where we should be spending all of our time, we should be moving to the country. And I would honestly believe that when we talk about the existential crises that exist right today in the coming years, we really, Baha'i communities really should take advantage of moving to the country in communities because they can be so much more wonderful, I think, than what we see in many of the cities around the world today. For example, the 240 kilometers away from me in, in Kyiv, the capital of Ukraine, everybody knows that this used to be a, um, a communist and very um, dictatorial society here in the Soviet Union. Um, and we need to find some way to move things into the right direction as we look into the future. Yeah, Liv, uh, Liv from Belgium, um, where they're from, said uh, the average age of farmers is 55 years old. I think, you know, in the Midwest where I was from, uh, mm -hmm. my family farm was from uh, also very elder. Um, oh, Bjorg has a lovely story. I paid Hukukula many years and prayed Baha'u'llah to help find some good people to take over. A young couple came this summer and asked to rent the land and the summer farm. Praying helps. I just wanted to say that here in Uganda, we spent the whole morning with our junior youth and youth, about 20 of them planting at least 60 trees in the property of the office of the mayor. We wanted lots of trees planted there. And the nurseries came from our, our house, my son's house and Peter's. Mom has got a nursery and we also bought some seedlings from a, another farmer up the road and another friend delivered them and we nice and the kids love it and they say we love nature and we I also mm -hmm. teach in the children's classes I also teach about you know take a breath where does your oxygen come from where else mm -hmm. in the world is there oxygen? where else in the 
solar system is there oxygen only here why why is there no because of the trees right or the crops why is there no oxygen at the top of the tallest mountain you have to carry your oxygen because there's no green you know so we just get and that this planet is so small so those are the things i put right through the children's classes i use the children's class book all the time but i add in that little bit of science that you know we're our God's bounty is the seas and the air and the water and everything, and it comes from the green plants. And then the kids have a, have a different attitude about it. Yeah, I think, you know, that's a perennial thing that keeps coming up, um, you know, that, uh, you know, Winnie, dear Winnie has, has a whole compilation that uh, she's been stewarding about a special regard for agriculture, right? That agriculture is actually one of the keys for the, uh, the, the future <laughs> and peace within the, within the Baha'i uh, revelation. And so, yeah, it's a perennial conversation about how do more, more Baha'is learn about that and how do we incorporate that really into uh, youth education and whatnot. Um, there is a three month course through the Wilmette Institute beginning in January, Baha'i Perspectives on Agriculture and Food and Gary Royce, who's here, as well as other, and Neil Watley, as well as other folks, uh, Kim, I hope I say it right, Nakvi, Arthur Dahl, Paul Hanley, are all faculty on that. So that's another place to send, uh, either attend or send folks you know. Um, such a wonderful, rich exploration together, folks. Janet, did you want to say another thing? Yes, please. I think another way of getting the young people involved is through the digital technology. So what we've been doing, the junior youth and youth came early to plant the trees, but then after they'd done that, we um, were given five laptops by friends, the Baha'i friends in, in uh, Kansas, the junior youth group in Kansas. So the kids are learning to use the tree mapper app and they're learning to search for information about what sort of trees. And so it's making all exciting for them, you know, because the technology, which is what they love is becoming very relevant. So for all the trees planted, they have the tree mapper app and it's gone by GPS satellite up to the plant for the, plant for the planet um, website where the people can, you know, send a dollar for a tree or something like that. And the kids are so excited about using the technology to back up and improve these because people here are so poor, they live on less than $2 a day. And, and so improving their agriculture doubles their income It's a huge, improvement you know using organics and getting better seeds it improves their yields and their incomes drastically doubling their yields you know so there's so much that can be done with the small farmers but the digital tech really helps it and then the youth really like that digital tech <laughs> janet is that the website that says a dot plant for the planet dot org yep okay i'm going to drop that in here and that's a kid. When he was nine years old, he went one. He met one Gary Matai, who was planted fifty-one million. And then, age eleven, he spoke to the United Nations, and they started this campaign saying, "Stop talking and start planting." And now he's still only twenty-one, and he's invented this app, which is so useful because it, moni it, it monitors the growth of the tree as well as knowing where it's been planted. It monitors how it's doing from satellite. <laughs> So he's still 21 years old. So the youth are amazing if they can get switched onto the agriculture. And I think it's fairly easy to our JY. I can send you the links for the exact lessons in children's class and junior youth books where it's very relevant to agriculture. And it's a service project. Of course, you can grow flowers and do all sorts of things. I think that should be a presentation. I think that should be one of the presentations we schedule where we let, you know, you and anybody else who's been doing this can start um, putting things together. That would be really wonderful. You get my daughter on the echo camps. That would be great. <laughs> she can show Bill's farm again. Cool. Um, I dropped Wangari Matai, uh, a link about that in there. Um, Gary, let's get you as our last question. And then I want to invite everybody to uh, join me in thanking Bill for this great presentation. Okay, I just wanted to mention that there is another, of course, reading group that's being led by uh, Dee Munson. Uh, we meet um, actually in about an hour from now, my time, every Sunday. Uh, let me just check and make sure I got it right. Um, um, we meet 
chat. Yes, we meet <laughs> in a half an hour every Sunday at the link that I've given before. And Lee, um, I think both of these, both um, Lee as well as Lucy Hines, are you know operating um, in the rural areas in agriculture in a kind of a a new uh, out in in doing things, not just talking about doing things, but actually doing things in many wonderful and I think very progressive ways. And so um, you, you're welcome to meet up. The link to the meeting is the Zoom that I Zoom link that I put on there, and we'd love to have more people involved. And and I think Dee does a wonderful job, and it's a great thing to get involved with. So I just wanted to make that one point. I right, came late. I came late. Please re-enter the Zoom link. Okay, it's uh, it's up above, but I'll put it again if I can. And Gary, just yeah, say yeah. again, what specifically is that group about, just so folks know? Um, well, um, let's put it this way. Um, Dee Munson is, and both, and Lucy, Dee and, and myself were all involved in, let's say, um, production and marketing and selling. You know, and so it's a it's a whole systems approach, how to do it properly, how to include everybody, and 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 Dee has a great amount of experience in this because she's been doing it for my gosh most of her life. She's involved in professional associations, working with her all of the aspects of you know food professionals and that sort of activity. So, um, I mean that's the main activities, and we're reading a book. Oh, what's the name of the book? I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of the book, but there's a book on that subject matter. I, I'll look for the book and try to put it in, in the chat in a second. <laughs> How to Feed the World. You got it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Winnie. <laughs> I just also like to mention another way to get the kids interested is to talk about food. If you talk about agriculture, they're not that interested. But if you talk about food, they're super interested. So all you need to do is put food and agriculture. Where does your food come from? What kind of food do you want to eat? And they care so much about climate and stuff that they'll eat, you know, um, less meat. They'll change their diet from that, from reducing carbon. And so then if you can link it to food, I find a lot of interest from the kids about food. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to invite everybody to join me in thanking Bill again for this wonderful presentation. Uh, learned so much. It was such a great opportunity to come together again. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for your dedication and time. You know, obviously you put several months into this presentation, Bill, if <laughs> not years. Um, so thank you. Yeah, it was a joy. Always, always a learning experience. Fantastic. And um, Don, is there any, Don, Winnie, any of the other conveners, is there anything we want to announce before folks drop today? Oh, and Mark, did you have your hand up? No. Okay. Great. Well, I want everybody to know that you are the next presenter. <laughs> and I think it's the 28th of November on the Village Storehouse. Yes. And we're, we're going to be workshopping the village storehouse. Like, what does that mean in, in our communities if we were to implement village storehouse principles? So uh, that will be at one on the 28th. Um, can the presentation be shared? Yes. So anybody who signs up on that list um, or goes to that website that I've been putting in the, the, uh, the MailChimp site one, let me grab it again. Uh, they're all there. All the recordings are there. So you can send people there um, and then um, they can see them. Is that the 28th of November? Yes. Okay, thank you. Right after U.S. Thanksgiving. Whoops, I think I put Ogungari Matai in there again instead of the, the MailChimp thing. Don, is there anything else that you wanted to say or... Uh, no, that, that, that was it. I, I just wanted to mention what, what's coming up next month. Great. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, Karen, you've mentioned Wangari a couple of times. And so the book uh, that we had on our reading list called Un Unbowed by her has mm -hmm. still not gotten off the ground. We have people interested, including the Kundals in Uganda. You so, get it. <laughs> yeah. Well, but we don't have a reading group on it yet. And Holy Aunts was interested as well. So it's a 
It's a fat, it's a fantastic book. You're absolutely right. It's very inspiring. She worked like she she was an an activist. She worked so hard. She she did. She won the um what is it called the prize um, um Nobel Nobel Peace Prize the Nobel yeah. Peace Prize right <laughs> yeah there's also there's also a movie about her that is just amazing really I haven't um, seen that. Go yeah, ahead. I'll have to see if I can find it. Um, I saw it actually when it was pre-production and it was amazing back then. So um, yeah, I'll see if I can find it. Great. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks Thank so much you. for coming. Thank Thanks you. to our wonderful presenter and our wonderful organizing team. And we'll see you again soon. What about the closing prayer? <laughs> closing <laughs> prayer. Let's stop the, let's. Go ahead and stop with that most important part. Well, I, I wonder if it's okay. You know, Richard St. Barr Baker was a Baha'i um, who founded the International Tree Foundation in 1922. And um, Shogi Effendi was the first lifetime member of that foundation. And he taught me, I met him when he was 92 and I was young. And so it had a big influence on my studies and everything. So I, he taught me a song. So I don't know if it's okay if I can sing that song. It's not actually a prayer, but it's very special to be able to transmit something that a 92-year-old gave to me as a 20-something-year-old. From our hearts, with our hands, for the earth, all the world together. From our hearts, with our hands for the earth, all the world together. From our hearts, with our hands for the earth, all the world together. Thank you, Lopa. I just dropped in the, the movie link, Taking Root, the vision of Wangari Matai. Um, Thank you. Bye, folks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you. Aloha. Uh.